anywhere from 10 to 30 million, according to what scholar you spoke to, they're actually mourning the loss because they were here before Columbus, although they're not given credit for that. The first National Day of Mourning was held in 1970, 349 years later. The Commonwealth of Massachusetts invited the Wampanoag, and some people say uh, Wampanoags, there's two different pronunciations for that particular Indian tribe, leader Frank James to deliver a speech. On the text of Mr. James' speech, a powerful statement of anger at the history of oppression of the native people of America became known before the event the Commonwealth disinvited him. They uninvited him. The silence of a strong and honest Native American voice led to the convening of the National Day of Mourning. The historical event we know today as the first Thanksgiving was a harvest festival held in 1621 by the Pilgrims and their Native American neighbors and allies. It has acquired significance beyond the bare historical facts. Thanksgiving has become a much broader symbol of the entirety of the American experience. Many find this a cause for rejoicing. The descending view of Native Americans who have suffered the theft of their land and the destruction of their traditional way of life at the hands of the American nation is equally valid. To some, the first Thanksgiving presents a distorted picture of the history of relations between the European colonists and their descendants and the native people. The total emphasis is placed on the respect that existed between the Wampanoags, led by the intertribal chief Massasoit, and the first generation of pilgrims in Plymouth. While the long history of subsequent violence and discrimination suffered by Native people across America is nowhere present. To others, the event shines forth as an example of the respect that was possible once, if only for the brief span of a single generation in a single place between two different cultures and as a vision of what may again be possible someday among people of goodwill. That sounds southern. Those who are indigenous to this land we call the United States of America have been long misrepresented and pushed out of American history textbooks in favor of glorifying those who now rule this nation and represent the dominant culture. What kind of democracy are we when our educational institutions and teachers refuse to mention the fact that 10 to 30 million natives were killed at the hands of European invasion and colonialism? What is the point of having a free market of ideas when selective and biased history is being taught? Erasing the memory of an entire race of people through distorted history is a systemic way of deceiving and lying. And I just want to say that there have always been those marginalized people in the world the same way that the Palestinians are marginalized today. Right now, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, there is a genocide going on of a race of people called Palestinians. The same thing was going on. And our country has covered up these genocides very, very nicely. And I think it's important for us to recognize this, for us to look at this, for us to be sensitive to those people. I was called to the hospital when we lived in Lake County, and there was a gentleman there that had embraced Islam 40 years before I was called to visit him. He was a Native American. Yes, he'd been a Muslim 40 years whenever I was called to uh, minister to him in the hospital. The chaplain mentioned to him, he, he signed, when he signed in the hospital, he said his religious preference was Muslim. And the chaplain said, well, we have an imam that comes to the hospital. Would you like to see him? And he first said no. And then he changed his mind. We read the Quran over him. He had literally been taken out of a convalescent home. They were not giving him much of a chance to live. They were supposed to do surgery the very next morning, and he was moved from intensive care to a regular room the very next day after we read the Quran over him. And uh, mashallah, a very, very interesting man.
but we are also subjected to an ever-growing culture of capitalism in which commercialization of an ambiguous holiday merely pulls us away from facts and meaning. Turkeys are associated with Thanksgiving in the same way Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny have become synonymous with Christmas and Easter, respectively. Through the guise of innocence, capitalism is constantly telling us to consume because consumption equals happiness. Black Friday is not Black Friday for nothing. Children dress up as pilgrims and natives to reenact the romanticized version of history. They are not only perpetuating stereotypes, but more importantly, they are being embedded with lies. What do they really know about the pilgrims and the natives? Consider a high school history textbook called The American Tradition, which describes the scene quite succinctly. And here's a quote. After some exploring, the pilgrims close, chose the land around Plymouth Harbor for their settlement. Unfortunately, they had arrived in December and were not prepared for the New England winter. However, they were aided by friendly Indians who gave them food and showed them how to grow corn. When warm weather came, the colonists planted, fished, hunted, and prepared themselves for the next winter. After harvesting their first crop, they and their Indian friends celebrated the first Thanksgiving. This patronizing version of history excludes many embarrassing facts of European history. As stated by James W. Lowen, author of Lies My Teacher Told Me, many college students are unaware of the horrific plague that devastated and significantly reduced the population of natives after Columbus arrived in the New World. Most diseases came from animals that were domesticated by Europeans. Cowpox from cows led to smallpox, which is later spread through gifts of blankets by infected Europeans. Of the 12 high school textbooks Professor Lowen studied and analyzed, only three offer some explanation that the plague was a factor of European colonization. The nine remaining textbooks mention almost nothing, and two of them omit the subject altogether. He writes, each of the other seven furnishes only a fragment of a paragraph that does not even make it into the index, let alone into the minds of students. Why, it is, important, why is it important to mention the plague? It reinforces European ethnocentrism. And I want to stop a minute to say that European ethnocentrism is still very alive and well in the United States of America. White people that look like me have privilege that we did not earn in this country. We walk into places and things happen for us that don't happen for people of color. And we need to realize that and we need to stand up against that. When we walk into a restaurant and someone of color is seated after us, but they came in first, we need to speak for that. We need to say, those people were here before me. Pronounce uh, eth ethnocentrism. Ethnocentrism. <laughs> ethnocentrism, yes. And it's, it's systemic within systems in the United States of America. And we did nothing to earn that, folks. As a matter of fact, we did something that should have caused us not to get it because we hurt so many other people. It reinforces European ethnocentrism, which hardly produced a friendly relationship between the natives and Europeans. To most of the pilgrims and Europeans, the natives were heathens, savages, treacherous, and satanic. That's what the white people said about them. Upon seeing thousands of dead natives, the governor of Massachusetts Bay Colony, John Winthrop, called the plague miraculous. And this is a quote that he wrote in a letter to his friend in England in 1634. But for the natives in these parts, God hath so pursued them. As for 300 miles space, the greatest part of them are swept away by the smallpox, which still continues among them. So as God hath thereby cleared our title to this place, those who remain in these parts, 
being in all not 50, have put themselves under our protection. And when you talk about people putting yourself under your protection, that's not the kind of protection that anybody in this room wants. That's called a dictatorship. It's called a form of slavery. The ugly truth is that many pilgrims were thankful and grateful that the native population was decreasing. Even worse, there was the Peacock Massacre in 1634, which started after the colonists found a murdered white man in his boat. Ninety armed settlers burned a native village along with their crops and then demanded the natives to turn in the murderers. When the natives refused, a massacre followed. Captain John Mason and his colonist army surrounded a fortified Peacock village and reportedly shouted, we must burn them. Such a dreadful terror. Let the Almighty fall upon their spirits that they flee from us and run into the very flames. I have to stop and ask, who were the satanic people here? Thus did the Lord judge the heathen, filling the place with dead bodies. The surviving peacock were hunted and slain. The governor of Plymouth, William Bradford, further elaborated, Squanto had learned their language, the author explained, from English fishermen who ventured into the New England waters each summer. Squanto taught the pilgrims how to plant corn, squash, and pumpkins. Would the small band of settlers have survived without Squanto's help? We cannot say. But by the fall of 1621, colonists and Indians could sit down to several days of feast and thanksgiving to God later celebrated as the first Thanksgiving. This text states the first Thanksgiving was on 1621. Indeed, there was a feast on that year, but it was not called a Thanksgiving feast, nor was it repeated until years later after the Peacock Massacre in 1637. In regards to Squanto, the correct question to ask is how did Squanto learn English? History textbooks neglect to mention that the Europeans did not perceive Squanto as an equal, but rather as an instrument of their God to help the chosen people. It is also admit, omitted that as a boy, Squanto was stolen by a British captain in 1605 and taken to England. He worked for a Plymouth merchant who eventually helped him arrange passage back to Massachusetts but less than a year later, he was seized by a British slave raider. Along with two dozen fellow natives, Squanto was sold into slavery in Spain. This is what should be taught in our school systems, not this romanticized lie. He would manage to escape slavery, journey back to England, and then talk a ship captain into taking him along on his next trip to Cape Cod in 1619. As Squanto walked back into his home village, he was horrified to find that he was the only surviving member of his village. The rest were either killed in battle or died of illness and disease. Excluding Squanto's enslavement is to paint an incredibly distorted version of history that suggests natives like Squanto learned English for no other reason but to help the colonists. It is to glorify the Europeans and erase the struggles and experiences of the native people. And we see this today. We see, still see this today in history. That history likes to glorify those things that so-called white people did. Well, I don't fit in that group because I'm red. Just look at me. But that's what we do. We glorify what white people did and anybody else, we try to discount what they did. When history is transformed into myths, tales, and bedtime stories, we ignore historical research that enables us to learn valuable and meaningful lessons about our present, as well as about our future. History is meant to be an accurate and honest account of civilizations, cultures, and events 
not a body of ethnocentric and selective alterations. As Professor Lowen said, Thanksgiving is full of embarrassing facts. The pilgrims did not introduce the Native Americans to the tradition. Eastern Indians had observed autumnal harvest celebrations for centuries. Our modern celebration dates back only to 1863. Not until the 1890s did the pilgrims get included in the tradition. No one even called them pilgrims until 1870. I did not conduct this class, I'm not conducting this class with intentions to offend or say that we shouldn't celebrate Thanksgiving. None of us are responsible for the atrocious deaths of natives and Europeans. None of us caused the plague or the massacres. But as human beings, I do feel that it's important for us to approach history with honesty and sensitivity. Perhaps some of you don't believe this history is relevant to you, but I would strongly argue that a history that is not inclusive is dangerously racist and prejudiced. Yes, we would spend time with our families and loved ones, and yes, we should be grateful and thankful for all that we have, but not at the expense of ignoring an entire race of people, their culture, and their history. The fact that history textbooks and schools try to glorify the pilgrims while omitting significant facts about the natives represents that there is a lot to improve in the United States. Let us not become blinded by super patriotism or blowout sales of Black Friday. Let us give some thought to the native people, learn from their struggles and embolden ourselves to stand up against racism and genocide in all forms. History is not a set of truths to be memorized. History is an ongoing process of interpretation and learning. The true richness and depth of history comes from multiplicity and complexity, from debate and disagreement and dialogue. There is room for more than one history. There is room for many voices. And if we look closer to home, on Thanksgiving Eve, it is the biggest night of the year for bars and clubs. According to my research, it is the number one holiday for drunk driving and DUIs. The typical American eats 4,500 calories and 229 grams of fat on that day. Well, as I said, I'm going to tell you the bad and the ugly, and then I'm going to tell you the good. But I think that gives you a balanced approach. I think it gives you a heart of empathy toward these people that have been disenfranchised and marginalized. And I think it's important for us to teach our children the truth about what happens in history. Yes, ma'am. How do you teach young children? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I had that. I was going to ask that too. As a teacher of young children, how do I teach this? I think you teach it the same way that you teach the glorified version. I don't think it's any different. I genuinely don't. You simply teach it. The textbook tells you this, but this is what really happened. And do your research. Give them an assignment and do research. Yeah. I mean, I give it to them. Give them handouts. I mean, that's the way I learned. Well, I think it's, I'm talking about, I think we need to be truthful with them, but I think it's, we, in our generation, we're trying to teach them this is the truth. Well, I think our generation is trying to teach them this is the truth. Well, as teachers, it's so hard. How do we as parents want children to have the bloody truth? As a Muslim, as a Muslim school, as a, as a Muslim school, we should be teaching truth. Now, I, I don't want to go into a discussion today because I want to talk about the good part. But it's my job to educate people that are not educated. I, I'm not going to stand for prejudice in my lifetime. 
I did not become a social worker so I should promote these lies and these indiscretions and these marginalizations of human beings. I have been fighting for women and for marginalized groups for many, many years. I risked my life in South Africa for six years fighting for Native Africans. And I'm not going to stop. And so you decide, because it is just as easy to teach the truth as it is to teach a lie. Teaching is teaching. When you go to college and you become a teacher, you learn how to teach. And you have a choice. You either teach the truth or you teach a lie. And that's how I see it. And that's just my opinion. My commentary is only mine. It is, might not be the beliefs of everybody else in ISLAM. So let me do that caveat like they do on the radio or TV when somebody gives a commentary. But I just feel like I have to do that little <laughs> disclaimer there. It's up to you. Yes, Dr. Stockton. I think that there's always a way to teach children in an age-appropriate way. Yeah. We teach four-year-olds about death. We teach five-year-olds about divorce. We teach six-year-olds about sexual abuse and predators on the internet. I think there is a way to teach them that you know there are always two sides to the story and there is this information out there and give it to them in an age appropriate way. Yes. But I yes. certainly believe that the truth can be taught at any age. But it, it breaks my heart because I see such a correlation to this and to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And there are other places in the world that I can make the same comparison. You know, we have to stand up against, particularly as Muslims, we have to stand up against racism and genocides that are going on in the world. So let's look at the spiritual side of Thanksgiving now. What I and how I believe that there is no holiday, that the spirit of the holiday is any more Islamic than Thanksgiving. And I will now defend that case, inshallah. Today's scholars are faced with a task that scholars of previous times did not have to reckon with. Before the age of globalization, scholars would render religious edicts, fatawa, about their own people and their own cultural affairs and their own countries and lifestyles about which they were un or which they were uniquely familiar. Today's scholars face and sometimes simply take upon themselves the colossal assignment of electronically rendering religious edicts about people, places, and cultures sometimes thousands of miles away from them where they have not lived, do not have an intimate working knowledge of, and are woefully unfamiliar with. I really sound like I'm on a soapbox today, don't I? Thank you, Yazan. Yes. was that applied to well-known and necessary matters of worship, akida, theology, and religious practice can be applied globally across all nations and people. And I am speaking from the fit that I gained from my master's in Islamic studies. I am not talking from my own opinion here. With regard to such issues, all Muslims are the same. And they all have the same obligations and responsibilities. For example, in issues of Salah, fasting, inheritance, and the like, all Muslims must adhere to the same Ahqam. However, Muslims in matters that have to do with tradition and cultural norms and regional circumstances, Muslim scholars should refrain from making rulings which prohibit the cultural practice of people in faraway lands. It is not common and virtually unheard of for scholars of Egypt to render fatwas against the people of Syria for what they are doing in their country, or for scholars of Saudi Arabia to render fatwas against the people of Bahrain for what they are doing in their country, or for the scholars of Lebanon or Algeria to render fatwas against the Muslims of Sudan for, they, for what they do in their country. Were they to do that, people would be insulted and take hyperbolic umbrage over it. There is a certain respect and acknowledgement of scholars to respect the boundaries, intelligence, and independence of Muslim people in other countries, 
to understand their own condition and to handle their own affairs accordingly. We are another marginalized group of people. People that have embraced Islam, converts are marginalized. When I sit down and have conversations, people that speak Arabic oftentimes think they have the last word. And they treat me like I'm stupid and a second class Muslim. Simply because I don't speak the language. This understanding and respect should also extend to Muslims and Muslim converts living in America. Muslim Americans have lived on this continent since the 1600s, long before this country even became a republic. They have endured under slavery, torture, illiteracy, and being bought and sold like cattle, and still manage to hold on to their faith. So to think that American Muslims of today do not know how to maintain or practice their faith in the midst of a country like the United States of America is untenable. And untenable is a soft word because it's more like ludicrous. It would be unthinkable for an American Muslim scholar or a man to render a ruling about practices in another country and be taken serious. And I think we have to take a stand, people. I think we've got to stop being whipping out and bowing down and kowtowing to what other people think we should do and our culture. We should stand up in front of the law and be accountable and speak the truth for our people so that our people are not oppressed. The Prophet وسلم, and his learned companions knew how to navigate their way through their society in a way as to avoid what was prohibited upon them. This is true for most Muslims. Once they know what is prohibited upon them according to the Quran and the Sunnah. If we can accept, as the majority of scholars do, that the companions of the Prophet were able to navigate through Arab society using the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah, then how can we not accept the possibility that American Muslims could do the same without outside help. Are we stupid? Are we moron idiot? Are we lower on the IQ scale than other people? I don't think so. The reason the Prophet Sallallahu migrated from Mecca to Medina was not because they were unable to conduct their affairs morally and comprehensively in an un-Islamic society. The reason he made the Hijra was because the Muslims were under persecution. And I sometimes feel as a convert that I'm under persecution. It is a historical fact that the first Hijra was because of persecution. And the same went for the second Hijra. This is why the Prophet Wasallam said, The best of you in Jahaliyyah are the best of you in Islam if they understand the religion. In order for people to understand the religion, the focus has to be upon the primary text of the Quran and the Sunnah, not the secondary opinions that are inconsistent with the original intention, the maqasid of Islam. Jahiliyyah is the people of ignorance. That prior to Islam, people referred to, just referred to as the days of Jahiliyyah or the period of Jahiliyyah, the period of ignorance. Thank you. Good. Thus, it is our view that scholars who are not intimately informed about people's daily lives and exchanges with their environments cannot and should not attempt to micromanage people's interactive navigation through life as they pursue the religious ideals and values for which Allah holds them accountable. During the last four or five decades, millions of Americans have converted to Islam and their families and extended families were not Muslim. People have used Thanksgiving Day for a day of strengthening family ties. 